Tom's World Scale Model Series. In this episode, we paint and weather our trumpeter AVGP Grizzly. If you enjoy programming on scale modeling, then show your support by subscribing to this channel. Leave us a comment, like, dislike, or share the video with friends. Clicking the notification bell gives you alerts when we post new content. Or visit the channel Tom's World for a friendly visit for a complete list of all our videos. Our build episode came off relatively hitch-free. Despite its bottom basement price of just $30, the kit's casting was finely detailed. But like the Trumpeter KV-1 that we built in a prior episode, our Grizzly also suffered from loose-fitting detailed pieces. The majority of parts that we attached to the hull required filling, and like our KV-1, our AVGP also required drilling or otherwise fixing or completing factory oversights, errors, or emissions. Still, despite the challenges, we successfully completed our major sub-assemblies, and the rest of our parts were clean up. So stick with us as we take this project through to completion with paint and weathering. With our Grizzly project moving into the painting and weathering stages, we have quite a few loose pieces to contend with. Since I prefer painting with an airbrush, I decided to mount the majority of the parts to card. To mount the parts, we'll use painter's masking tape. We attach the tape sticky side up. We can then mount our loose parts to the card. This gives us a convenient way of holding the pieces while we spray them and while they dry. For pieces that require paint on all sides, we'll have to flip the parts over so we can paint their backside. Sometimes a little of the tape adhesive may stick to the parts when removed from the card, so make sure to clean any residue off of surfaces that'll get paint. There are little mounting holes on these differential housings so we can insert a toothpick. This is a great way to hold the parts since we can get at all the surfaces with our paint. We can use these little alligator clamps for holding some of the parts, like the gun barrels. We don't want to forget to mask the rear lights. This will protect the red lamp lenses from overspray. I also masked off the swing arm area where the wheels get attached. That gives us bare plastic to glue our wheels to, which will give us a strong joint. For my undercoat, I tinted up a bare metal color using black, rust, and a touch of white enamel. For this project, our undercoat will function more as a primer coat rather than as pre-shading. Instead of creating our highlights, shadows, and faded panels with our undercoat, we'll use old paints at a later stage in the weathering process. For now, most of our parts get the raw metal enamel color. I sprayed a little white acrylic on the cupola in the areas which get covered with the periscope lenses. The white in turn gets masked off with tape to protect it from our final green coat. As we saw in our unboxing episode, the color callout chart that comes in the kit translates the vehicle's green color to Tamiya's XF20. This is incorrect since SF20 is actually a medium gray color. Instead, I used XF58 olive green lightened with a little XF60 dark yellow. I thinned these colors with Tamiya lacquer thinner so they float nicely through my airbrush. We contemplated giving our Grizzly black stripes, but I settled on the traditional monochrome green since it's the color I most associate with the Canadian Army. Once the green coat is thoroughly dry, I overspray everything with a clear gloss acrylic. This seals the paint and allows for our pin wash, which we'll apply later to flow properly. I use this pledge floor polish thinned with about 25% water for my gloss coat. Any gloss will do, but we want to use an acrylic. Since we'll be using oil paints thinned with mineral spirits to wash and weather our model, we don't want the mineral spirits dissolving our gloss coat. For the three clear panels that make up the driver's windscreen, I misted them with clear green acrylic. We go very light with the green, just enough to give the impression the glass is tempered. For the Commander Coppola Periscope lenses, I applied a heavy coat of clear red acrylic. You could use clear green to depict standard Periscope lenses, but I really like the look of the red laser protective style of glass. Some parts, like the vehicle drivetrain, suspension, and guns got a coat of black enamel. Flat black works best, but I ran out, so I used a semi-gloss black instead. We can then color these parts with our pencil. This gives us a great looking bare metal look. To achieve the finish, I use a soft graphite pencil. I use a 9B, which is the softest tip available. As we demonstrated here on our Opal Blitz build video, we simply color our black parts with the pencil. We press hard with the pencil, which burnishes the graphite. We can increase the shine by further polishing with a cotton swab. 
We can now install the drivetrain, suspension parts, steering assembly, and torsion bar protective covers. Although most of this detail is hidden beneath the vehicle, I still take the time to make it look good. This is especially important if you're contest building, as inquisitive judges will no doubt give these details some attention. The metal color also provides nice contrast to the green and gives us a greater sense of realism and weight. Time to tackle the decals. The kit comes with a small sheet and the decals are good quality. The little Canadian flags are nice, they're sharp and colorful and look great once applied. The carrier film is tight on the smaller lettering but the large S4 stencil has quite a bit of film in between the letters. There are also quite a few small labels, 15 in all. Trust Army planners to use hard to see black lettering over a dark green vehicle. For whatever reason, Trumpeter puts the vehicle's license plates on the full color paint guide. We can cut them out with scissors and attach them with thick CA. For the large S4 lettering, I cut away as much of the carrier film as I could. It makes it much more difficult to apply the fragile decals, and we have to be careful with the letter spacing and orientation. I'm always paranoid about silvering and other decal vagaries, and I find the extra effort of cutting the large letters out helps to get better results. I always use decal softener even if applying decals to flat surfaces. Any brand will do. We apply three or more generous coats of softener over the decals, allowing each coat to dry in between. Then with a cotton swab dipped in softener, we press the decal firmly to flatten it and to remove air bubbles. Rolling the swab over the decals also helps to remove any trapped air bubbles. If you're using a cotton swab, make sure to remove any stray cotton hairs. We'll be overcoating the decals with more clear gloss and we don't want to seal any hairs in the finish. This shot illustrates how the large S4 stencers are offset on the model. This is due to the muffler housing on the starboard side. And here's the model with the decals and paper license plates applied. I then spray over the decals and plates with more clear gloss to seal them in. As always, we begin our weathering with streaks. We've covered this process in more detail in previous videos, so we'll time lapse the sequence here. We use old paints in burnt umber, khaki, white, and black colors. To get the paint on, we can dab on dots or draw rough lines like I'm doing. Then with a wide brush dipped in mineral spirits, we draw the colors down in the direction rain and condensation would flow over the vehicle if it were in the field. The amount of paint you leave on is really a matter of taste, but I prefer subtle streaks so I remove most of the paint. And here's the look we're after. Notice how the streaking tones down the starkness of the decal while softening its edges. The streaks also break up the otherwise solid and flat base color. We weather our model in layers and our streaks are just the first step. We'll be using this pigment powder on our model. This one is from Vallejo. They call it light sienna but the color is essentially a light khaki. We need to mix up a batch of oil paint to match this color. To create this light sienna khaki color, I use yellow ochre, burnt umber, white, and a touch of sap green. I use it undiluted with a touch of white to create mud on the lower hull. I'll also thin some and use it for a pin wash. For our pin wash, we want to make sure we dilute our paint enough so it flows off our brush through capillary action. Our gloss coat helps the paint to flow. We apply the pin wash to seams, nooks, crannies, and the edges of raised details. Once our paint is sufficiently dry, usually when it becomes dull, we can dab it with a soft brush. This blends and feathers the edges and removes any leftover tide marks. And here's the look after blending. We're trying to achieve the look of dried and caked on dirt and grit. The sort of dust on drab look that's so typical of military vehicles that operate in the field. Next, we blend in patches of a dark raw metal color. We mix burnt umber with black oils to achieve the tone. We use a soft brush and very little paint and with a gentle dabbing motion, we build up the color gradually, blending and feathering the dark patches into the base color. Using the same dark steel oil color, we can brush the vehicle's edges. We use a wide stiff brush and we draw the color down the hull. And here's the look so far. The dark color creates realistic looking warm paint edges. 
It also replicates dirt and grease stains while breaking up the otherwise flat and bland green overall color. We can see how the dark edges on the passenger compartment hatches gives us contrast. This helps the hatches stand out from the vehicle's deck. We can also add a few highlights using our undiluted khaki oil color lightened with a little white. Again, we use a soft dry brush with very little paint, gradually building up the color using a gentle dabbing motion to blend and feather the colors together. The highlights and shadows create beautiful contrast on the otherwise relatively bland and flat surfaces. Next comes a few more swipes of my lead pencil. I highlight edges and other surfaces that are prone to wear. Here I'm working on the driver's hatch. The pencil, when rubbed over the dark metal tones that we added earlier, creates a very realistic worn metal look. The glints catch the light beautifully and give the model weight by giving the impression it's made of metal rather than plastic. To finish the guns, I'll use this metallic gunmetal pigment powder. This one happens to be a MIG product. You could just as well use graphite powder or even your pencil if you don't have pigments. The guns got a black enamel coat first, then we simply dry rub the pigments on. This soft makeup applicator brush is ideal for this job. We can leave the finish muted or polish the powder to a brilliant shine. Turning our attention to the Coppola, to complete it we must install the periscope vision lenses. And here's our Coppola ready for its lenses. I wasn't sure what color to paint these areas behind the lenses, but I thought white would make the red color stand out. If we use too dark a color, the lenses end up looking too dark, almost black. The lenses are tiny, but a little poster tack on the end of a toothpick makes a great tool for holding and positioning the lenses. We can use white glue smeared on the lens edges to hold them in place. I'll have to touch up the white border around the lenses that my masking left behind. And here's the finished look. We covered applying mud and filth to our models in other episodes, namely our KV-1, FT-17 and M5 builds. For more detailed look, these videos are recommended. We've time-lapsed the sequence here as an overview of how we apply pigment powders, oil paint grime, mud and splatters. And here's the look after mud and gunk layers are applied. The natural rubber color of the wheels that come in the kit look good, so there's no need to paint them black. We then apply a pin wash to the tire's front and back walls. The road surfaces of the tires are then painted using a thick mixture of sienna pigment powder diluted with alcohol. We give the surfaces a good thick coat, making sure the mixture seeps into the crevices. The color is almost imperceptible when wet, but it does lighten as it dries. We then rub the color off the road touching surfaces with a finger or swab dipped in water. Creating realistic mirrors for model vehicles has always been a challenge and the Grizzly has two of them, four panels in all, to contend with. I've used silver enamel paint in the past which for tiny round mirrors works adequately. After all, the silver paint looks so promising in the jar, but for large mirrors, not so much. Silver paint is certainly reflective. We see how well it reflects the video light that's just above it. But when turned slightly, we can see how awful the silver paint looks from certain angles. I had some of this foil duct tape on hand. It's pretty thin, very reflective, and has an adhesive backing. Definitely a promising mirror material. I also found this snack bar wrapper which has an amazing silver backing. I stripped the silver paint off the mirrors with lacquer thinner. I then attached the candy wrapper to one mirror and the duct tape on the other. The wrapper produced a decent surface finish and it's certainly shiny and very reflective. The duct tape seemed to produce slightly better surface finish. It was just as shiny as the wrapper, but it was just slightly less reflective. I think both work just as well and while not perfect, it's definitely an improvement over the silver paint. 
We're getting near to completing this project other than a few odds and ends to glue down or attach. For this I use CA glue and this thin stuff works really well. Only problem is, even with the fine tipped attachable nozzles, thin CA has a nasty habit of flowing uncontrollably. And after two near catastrophic incidents of leaking CA all over the place, I needed a better solution. I had these micro brushes in my stash. The tip is very fine and has very very delicate bristles. We can pour out a small puddle of the thin CA onto a piece of card and we can dip our micro brush into the CA and apply it very precisely to the joints we're gluing. Our model is finally finished and these desktop shots allow us to gaze upon her handiwork. It still needs final touches, a spritz here and there of dull coat, maybe a little more pigment powder on the tires. But otherwise our little grizzly is ready for its photo shoot. When we build the trumpeter kit, we do trade time for money. That is, while trumpeter kits tend to be less expensive than other brands, they usually require more work and time to raise them to show standards. Trumpeter kits are nicely detailed and their casting tends to be crisp and sharp. In value adding features such as clear parts, slide molding, wire for tow cabling, photo etch and so on are usually included in the kits. But trumpeter parts often need drilling, scraping or other alteration. And both our KV-1 and Grizzly also need filling on practically every small attachment. And while the kit's rubber tires are quite nice, a retooling is in order to produce more snugly fitting rims. Still there are very few AVGP kits on the market and the Trumpeter line provides us with solid releases in each variant. The kit was easy if not labor intensive to build, but it was really fun to paint and weather. And that'll do it for this episode. Check back soon for more unboxings and build videos coming up in the very near future. In the meantime, why not subscribe to the channel? Otherwise, leave us a like, dislike, or feel free to grumble in the comments. Or drop by the channel Tom's World for a complete list of all our entertaining and educational videos. In the meantime, keep the peace, stay well, and all the best.